for the Alliance for Peace. You have to press got it. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the Alliance for Peace Building is a membership based organization. We have over 170 organizational members. Uh, we work on, we tackle issues that are too large for any one organization. If you're not a member, we encourage you to become a member. Um, let us know and we'll get information to you. And we are only as strong as how we work together collectively. So, um, so please join us. Um, and I hope you saw the video uh, made the case for why peace building and how we do it and how important it is right now. But I know you all came here for this event today on this incredible ecological threat report out by the Institute for Economics for Peace. Uh, it's a brilliant report. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why it's so brilliant, because it is data. This is your third year doing it. Um, these types of data and the consistent data are so incredibly important. I'll even go back to your positive piece, uh, the violent extremism, um, report that you have out. Uh, why are these so important? They're so important because it's the way that we're able to show policymakers, donors, the public, how the data is telling us what is happening. And I was just realizing this uh, when I was putting something together. We have on a lot of these reports, not this one, but a lot of this you know, we're going, we're starting to get a decade, two decades of data. And that was what helped us put forth the Global Fragility Act. Um, this data helped us, um, and Tegan, I'll get to you, but um, we worked with AFP, worked with USIP, the Wilson Center Interaction, to say that climate and conflict are compounding each other. And we were able to get so much of that work into USAID's new uh, climate change policy. We couldn't do it without this data. So it's so incredibly important. Um, I'm gonna stop there because I wanna turn it over to the expert. Steve, um, you're you know, brilliant at this. Your organization is phenomenal and we are grateful for this work. So I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can tell us the key findings and what we need to know out of this report. So thank you. Well, great. Well, thank you for the introduction, Liz. Uh, it's great to be here. It's nice to see such a large audience. And what I'll do is I'll just step through the global, the ecological threat report, which are for this year, which is the third report we've put out. We launched it yesterday. Uh, it's a great, it's had global publicity. I think at the 10 hours after the launch, there's 725 news articles around the world. It's been carried by Reuters, AP, EFI, which is the major distribution channel for news stories into Latin America, Bloomberg, and many, many others. So without more to do, I'll share my screen and we'll launch into it. Right. Okay. So first up, I might do just a little bit of background for the Institute for Economics and Peace for those who don't know it. The Institute was set up to understand the intersection between business, peace, and economics, place a special emphasis on metrics to measure peace, then ascribe an economic value to change and changes in peace, and then to also hold operational programs to improve peace. So if we look at it, the, we're globally situated, headquartered in Sydney, Australia, offices in Brussels, Den Haag, Harare in Zimbabwe, Mexico City, and also in New York. The work is used by most of the major multilaterals around the world, and that includes people like the OECD, Commonwealth Secretariat, World Banks, United Nations, and many, many more. Last year, we had 28 billion media impressions, 1.4 billion social media impressions, and we got about 2 million people visiting our website. The work now is included in thousands of universities around the world, and we've got active programs uh, on peace now. This is mainly our positive peace work, which is occurring in over 30 countries, be at least 30 countries. So now that's enough of the advertisements. Let's move into the ecological threat report. So this ranks 120, 228 independent uh, 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 countries and territories. 
we've really broken it this year down even more more grant more a, a granular than that and we're covering 3638 local administrative areas globally 250 cities were analyzed and what we've done is brought, brought it down to what we'd term mega cities so they're, they're cities which have analyzed where there'll be more than 10 million people living in those cities by 2050 literally we cover almost all the population of the world 99.99 percent of the population we've got nine indicators we use and we literally use thousands of different data sets to assess the ecological vulnerability resilience and risk for these 3638 administrative areas in 228 countries so all this breaks down into four domains uh, food security water stress population growth and that's something which you'll see in this through this presentation is really important and natural disasters come down to two types of measures which we use and then we take this and we identify what we term as hotspot countries they're the 27 countries with the worst ecological threats and also the lowest societal resilience because societal resilience really determines the outcomes so I'm just going to start with one simple statistics, and this, 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 I think, frames the next 30 years. Currently, if we look at the 127 current countries which face at least one catastrophic threat or more, there's 2 billion people living in them. By 2050, the population in those same 20, 127 countries has increased by 66%. Now, many of those 120 27 countries will be fine. They have the social resilience to be able to cope with their threats. Uh, uh, although it will create economic costs and it will take a lot of energy and effort to get there. The main findings, which Liz has really pointed to in her opening remarks, is there's this intimate relationship between ecological degradation, violence and conflict and also societal resilience. And these end up forming what we'd see as vicious cycles of violence. So what we can see in the ETR, the scores worsen, peacefulness deteriorates. And that's unless there's the appropriate societal resilience to be able to absorb and manage the shock and then adapt for the future. So the world's, just to really drive it home, the world's 40 least peaceful countries will increase their population by 1.3 billion. That now will be 49% of the world's population. They also have the same countries, the worst ecological scores. Currently, 750 million people are suffering from undernourishment, and that's only going to get worse as we move further on. Now, climate change. So we've been working doing analysis of a, a concern over climate change for 120 odd countries. So since the before COVID till now, the concern over climate change has dropped by 1.5% globally. We went to the three, the four biggest a, a emitters of greenhouse gas emissions. They have very low levels of concern, China, India, and Russia. World's fastest growing megacities are also the ones least capable of managing the growth. And countries with high social resilience, they'll be able to meet their ecological challenges. So they're places like North America, Europe, Australia, Japan, and such. So now if we look at Sub-Saharan Africa, it's facing the biggest challenges. So all but one country is facing severe water stress. 89% of the people facing food insecurity globally are in sub-Saharan Africa, another 44 million in the Middle East and North Africa. That's the next major area. So now this is a stunning stat. The population of sub-Saharan Africa will increase by 95% or projected to by 2050. 15 of the countries in the world will more than double their population in the next 30 years. And what you find is all of them are residing in sub-Saharan Africa. Five mega cities with the largest population growths are also in sub-Saharan Africa. And six of the 10 least peaceful countries in the world are also located there as well. So we go back to the 27 hotspot countries, which I'll come to. Two out of every three of those countries are in sub-Saharan Africa. 
and seven out of the eight countries with the worst score on the uh, for ecological risk also lie in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, let's just come around and look at this. So each country has a certain level of ecological health. Now, what happens? They get hit by an ecological shock, which manifests. That may be major or that may be minor. Now, what that'll do then is that impacts and then the societal resi resilience will determine the coping, the coping capacity. If the societal resilience is low, that shock will have a deliberating effect on, on the society. If the social resilience is strong, then that'll, that should, uh, then they'll be able to cope and quite often adapt and be better when they hit the next shock. Now, what happens then, they got the low societal resilience, the likelihood of conflict increases, which then creates further ecological degradation. That now feeds back into the ecological health. So next time you get a shock, it's a, you need a, not as a significant a shock to cause this whole cycle to go again. So now this is the, if we're looking at the ecological threat report, if you look at this, this will give you an idea of a heat map of where the biggest de eco impact of ecological threats are. You'll find that they're in the Middle East, Africa, parts of the uh, Latin America and parts of Asia. Blue is very, very good. You'll find that it's predominantly up in Europe. And this will give you an idea by regions of the world. So Europe, North America are the ones which are average regions, which are most likely. We've got the least ecological threats and most likely to uh, be able to cope with them. Partly that's because they've got the highest positive piece, the two regions globally. And also they've got a history of being able to build the infrastructure to be able to absorb and adapt for past shocks, which means they're less likely to be hit by future ones. Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, South America, are the ones which are facing the most stress. Let's have a quick look at country hotspots. So there are 30 countries a year in the world. This should read, there are 27. So this should read 27 countries with the lowest positive piece and the worst ecological shocks. So they're home to 768 million people. So we use positive piece to measure social resilience because it's, and I won't go into it in detail, but it's statistically associated with higher levels of food security, water security, uh, uh, well-being, happiness, and the ability to manage natural disasters. So what we do is we take a combination of the positive piece and the ecological uh, threat report to be able to identify countries where the resilience is not strong enough to be able to adapt to major shocks. That's called a hotspot country. So there are 27 of these hotspot countries globally. Uh, uh, they're home to 738 million people. These are the hotspot countries. You're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but you'll notice that there's nine countries there which have got a, a, a facing extreme uh, ecological threats on all four of the domains which we're measuring. And when you look at them, uh, all bar two uh, lie in sub-Saharan Africa, one in the Middle East, which is Yemen, and Afghanistan, which is in South Asia, the other two. So again, this will give you an idea again, of the, as we're looking at these hotspot countries, you'll see there are some, there is one in Latin America, more in the Middle East and North Africa, and also some one in Russia and Eurasia, Tajikistan, and also a one in South America, which is Venezuela. These are where the hotspot countries are located globally. So that gives you a quick idea on a mud map to better understand it. Now, what we've done is, as I mentioned, we've taken 3,368 different administrative districts around the world. Now, what we've done is we've Picked, we found that 47, th sorry, 37 of these sub-districts face a catastrophic threat on all four domains. They're home to about 37 million people. And this gives you a very, very clear idea now as if you want to have interventions where you really should be aiming. So these in countries like Somalia, Southern Sudan, Car, Mozambique, Southern Sudan, Again, back in the second ones in Somalia, Southern Sudan, and Uganda. 
And these countries here, I think they're home to about 16 million people. But that gives you a clear idea of where the worst threats are and where the most action should be. But you can see they're already some of the most troubled places in the world and from a conflict perspective. And again, it's driving home this relationship between conflict, low societal resilience and ecological degradation. So let's a few facts on food security. 41 countries face extreme food security. 830 million people live in these countries. So food spheres of food security is described as where more than 65% of the population were unable to afford food for a full day at least once in the prior year. So Sub-Saharan Africa has the largest proportion, 14 times higher than the next region, Middle East and North Africa. So 92% of food insecure people live in low peace countries. Again, the relationship back to conflict. The largest deteriorations in the last two years have occurred in Colombia, Syria, Ethiopia, and Mozambique. Now, this graph really drives it home. So this is the number of undernourished people globally. And if we went back decades, it was improving. And then it started to plateau about 2013. And since 2017, has been deteriorating. And then you can see with the start of COVID, this massive uplift. So the drivers were in place prior to COVID. But what we can see since the bottom now, there are 35% more people undernourished globally uh, than what there was in 2017. These figures are only going to get worse in the next few years as we're seeing the effects of the Ukraine-Russian war flow through. We can see increases in food prices, which have occurred globally, inflation's taking off. And it's particularly uh, evident in the uh, poorer countries with higher inflation, they have a higher inflation rates. And also we're moving into a global economic downturn over the next couple of years. So the next few years, this chart's going to uh, you know, look even worse. Let's have a look at water for a few minutes. More than 1.4 billion, and I'm saying billion people globally are exposed to extreme levels of water stress. That's in 83 different countries. Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Latin America suffer the worst stress. Even European countries, are, 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 when we project out to 2050, will suffer a, from water stress. Greece, Italy, Portugal, Netherlands, to name some. But the social resilience in these countries is strong. So they're probably going to be, they're, they're probably, in fact, it's more than likely, they'll be able to adapt to these future challenges as they arrive. Conflict as a trigger for conflict has actually increased three times since 2000. Iraq, Somalia, and Yemen, again, all conflict countries, have had the most water-related conflicts in the last 20 years. So we move forward, damming is going to become more and more of a major issue. So just giving you an idea, the Mekong, Mekong River, which is getting more and more dams built on it all the time, 300 million people are dependent on it. If we go to the Nile River, which we're seeing getting uh, dammed, got 200 million people dependent on that. And there's very little in the way of international statutes around the rights of downstream countries to water. Population projections. Now, if we're looking at population projections, the yellow line on this, that's countries with the low peace. And you can see the population projections there are going to go up really quite substantially. In fact, if we're looking at the low peace countries, you're going to find that over 80% of the population growth in the next 30 years will be probably in the 15 countries with the lowest peace. The grey line, which is the, uh, uh, the least uh, uh, easiest to see line, that's the well-developed countries. You can see that the populations there are plateaued, and in fact, they're projected to decrease by 1% between now and 2050 without immigration. These are the, uh, these are the countries, the 15 countries, which will double their pop more than double their population in the next 30 years. Note, they're all in sub-Saharan Africa. 
All right, a little bit on natural disasters. Asia is the area which is most impacted by natural disasters. Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America and the Caribbean follow. Uh, the cost actually is rising since we went back to the 1980s. It was about 50 billion was the cost. Today, or in the last decade, it was about 200 billion, four times as much. And we'll only expect to see that continue. Flooding is the most common over 5,000 incidents since 1981. And if, when we look at the 27 uh, ETR hotspot countries, which I mentioned earlier on, you'll find ones like Afghanistan, Haiti, Pakistan, Nigeria, Mali, are all countries which have had big increases in natural disasters in the last 40 years. Now, for looking at the number of people who are displaced by conflict, it keeps increasing. These aren't new numbers for most people in this audience. 89 million people are currently displaced. That's up 3.5% from the prior year, but it doesn't include the Ukraine, where some people would estimate 12 to 14 million people are currently displaced. Displacements from natural disasters are usually short. The famine finishes, the flood subsides, and they go back to where they came from. However, when it's conflict displacement, uh, the return rates are much, much lower. And when we're looking at that, one third of all people displaced travel more than 500 kilometres. That's quite a distance. So five countries with the largest conflict displacements in 2021 were Syria, Ethiopia, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Afghanistan, Southern Sudan, now, the countries which received the most refugees in 2021 were in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Uganda, and between them, they took in over 6.5 million people in 2021. Europe also took in over a million people with Germany uh, taking in the most, with Sweden, Austria, and Greece also taking in substantial numbers as well. Right, climate survey. So we're getting towards the end. We've got about another four or five slides and then we're done. So if we're looking at that, as I mentioned in the opening remarks, concern for climate change has dropped by 1.5%. It's now down to 48% globally. And this shows the effects of uh, other uh, major in incidences on the global uh, psyche and mindset. That's particularly obviously COVID. South America surprisingly has the highest rating at 65%. Middle East and North Africa are the lowest at 27%. Now, some parts of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, rank war, terrorism, climate, and violence as greater concerns than climate change. This takes the six biggest CO2 emitters and gives you an idea of the, where they stand against the global average, which is the bar on the far side in Maroon. Note that China has got one of the lowest scores in the world and concern has dropped by 3%. Temperature will play a major part as we move forward. So for every 1.5% that there's more, a, every 1% there's more, a, 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 the, the earth heats up, it holds 7% more moisture. That was, means the number of a, a natural disasters will increase as we move forward. Uh, and that's simply because the atmosphere can hold more water. It means longer droughts. And when it does drop, it drops much more heavily. So we're down to about the last slide, last series of slides now. This will be the increase in urban population running out between uh, 2010 out to 2050. No, rural areas have a slight decline. Most people will be in cities. So currently, when we there are 34 megacities, there'll be at least, and these are really conservative numbers, 47 by 2050. These, these fast-growing cities all face similar, char, similar challenges. The first is they lack the financial capacity to be able to cope with the growth. They have high rates of violence, both petty crime, organised crime, high levels of civil unrest, pervasive pollution, poor sanitation, and high population growth. The least resilient cities globally, and we've worked out a matrix of 10 different dimensions to calculate this, would be Kinshasa, Nairobi, Lagos, Dhaka, Baghdad, Lahore, Kolkata, and Delhi. Nine cities in the world, and they're mainly in India and China, have 20 times, and I mean 20 times, the WHO's recommended maximum air pollution. Some 
some studies have put the cost of the of the pollution at the about 8.1 trillion dollars and may cost six to nine million lives each year. 20, in 2050, 6% of the cities in low peace countries will be the fastest growing. And now I think I'll pull up on the policy recommendations. We have a number here in the fullness of time. And that, my friends, is the end of the presentation. Can you put the policy slides back up? Sure. Okay. Let's just realize it's a fast paced presentation. Yeah. This one I didn't want to take um, up too. So these are basically to give an idea. So currently it's pretty obvious. You can see from this presentation that current, current policies aren't enough to reverse the deterioration in the environment. And that's particularly true for the poorest and least peaceful countries. So now countries with the highest resilience, they're going to have challenged, but they'll, they'll muddle their way through and may emerge even stronger and better capable of facing future shocks. One of the things lacking is a real analysis of the social systems so that we can better understand the interaction between the social systems and the environment to get better outcomes. It's population in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa particularly is really key and we really need better population planning. Obviously, it's got to be culturally sensitive, but it's urgently, urgently needed. Without it, they, I think the sustainability is almost impossible. There has to be real, and a lot of this comes from, this next couple come from personal experience of a family foundation. It's active in the developing world. We've done about 220 projects now working with the poorest of the poor. A lot of them has been around food production, water capture and, and, and ecological sustainability and health. And so what we really need is to focus on water, micro water capture. And that will then help the poorest of the poor. And so that's examples of the, without going into the detail, uh, yeah, how do you build a, a, a small ponds? How do you use sand dams so you can collect below the water surface, which it doesn't evaporate? How can you do this cheaply? And that then can enable food production. If you've got the food production, you can actually create mi micro value added businesses. So examples of this, we'll put in a sand dam will then have the people then rather having one crop a year, three crops a year, might be producing pineapples, let's say, then you build a cannery off the side of that. Now they've got the ability to get value added to cannery, so they'll have pineapple juice, canned pineapple, pineapple wine, and now, now you're starting to build an ecosystem which is helping the poorest of the poor. Most projects on economic development will be small, a, 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 a small projects for very small micro business development, like $100, $500 for women. Or if it's the governments, they look at how, how do we build a dam for major a, a agriculture, but that doesn't really help the poorest of the poor. Micro projects really need strong community design. Uh, and a lot of people say this, but not many aid agencies actually do it because quite often it's the local communities really know best is what they want. The other thing is we really need to be, build the biomass on the planet. So we've developed, we've been working for quite a while now with farmer managed natural regeneration. This is cheap, it's training. But there's over a, a million hectares globally now, which have been reinvigorated using FMNR techniques. They're highly scalable, they're cheap, very successful. So the first place in the world that done was in Niger. Don't know if anyone remembers the slide on population growth. Niger has the largest population growth in the world, projected to be 183 percent between now and 2050. In 2019, it was the only country in the world to increase their natural foliage cover. And that was because of FMNR. So it's a go, it is one thing which is a game changer. And that, my friends, is the end of one very, very, very fast presentation. <laughs> okay. The data, um, I know the report is has it just come out? Is it has yeah, it been released? Yeah, I know it is we, released. we had we had seen it before. So um it is just released. I know people oh see did it. I'm I'm so the, the report is out as of today. Um, I know there was a question I saw come up about are the slides available, but 
all th this data is in um, the key findings. Um, so you can find it here. And I think we, we put, did we put the link in the chat to it? Okay. We'll also make the uh, slides available as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Alliance for Peace Building have a copy of the slides. Okay. So we'll. And so we're, we're very happy for people to pick it up, use the slides in any of the presentations you've got. Just make reference to the data does come from the Institute of Economics and Peace. Okay. Um, and you'll we'll have all of this on our website. So a couple of questions before we move on. Um, I wanted to see um, uh, how does IEP, well, well, first of all, you mentioned it. When did this data, when did you, when did the data have to stop for you to start analyzing it? At what point in 2021? So it's a good question. So as I mentioned in the opening part, there's probably building up in all this, there's about a couple of thousand different data sets we've actually pulled together in, in different parts. Some of the data will relate back to a couple of years ago. Other data will be more recent. Other parts of the data we use, we get to be anything up to a couple of months okay. before the start of the index or this before the start of the work we do. So if we went back and let's say global terrorism index is a good one. We usually, we, we've we got data on that. So it's generally we're one to two weeks behind a terrorist attack okay. uh, uh, with the data we've got for that. So that'd be one example there. Uh, some other stuff and like this might be military uh, uh, military data, which we've got can be two years old. But the changes in military hardware, for example, don't change fast. So yeah. if you're a couple of years slow, that's okay because that kind of data takes the organisations get it a long while to compile. So it varies. It varies greatly depending on the data set and the source of the data set. Okay. So sobering data, but what you're saying is it's it's not lagging that far behind in terms of when you started doing the analysis to put this together. Oh no, no, okay. not that's yet. The, yeah. right, because... a lot of the stuff does change slowly. Yeah. So if it's slow changing data, two years okay. is okay. Okay. All right. So that um so if we looked at the climate concern, uh that was a survey, what first one was done 2019. It's done through the year. Gallup is the people who do it. And the data we used here, that was all done in 2021, and it okay. would have been done through the year, with the last of it being from December 2021. Okay, so I have a couple of higher questions um, that I just want to ask Steve really quickly, and then we'll move on. But um, the World Bank has predicted 1. Uh, 1 billion climate refugees by 2050. Um, uh, also, how does um uh your thoughts on implementing large scale managed retreat away from areas that are becoming increasingly difficult to live in you don't have to look any farther than florida here for example um and then one other well have we have we already will we be able to prevent the 1.5 to 2 degrees celsius sort of that tipping point um so my, my, my views on that, I think climate change, we will solve with time. I think the technological advances are already there, but it's going to take quite a while for it to roll out. The ones where it's going to roll out in the uh, yeah, yeah, longest period of time will be in the poorest countries in the world, because to get the infrastructure, it costs a lot of money to go over green, and, and you've got to get the cars, and the cars tend to be more expensive and uh, people buying cars in a lot of the poorer countries in the world, well, $400, $500 on a car is, is, is a lot of money. So I think uh, uh, I think the technology will be there. I don't think we're going to be able to hold it under two degrees Celsius. That's my gut feeling. But I don't think we're going to get to the catastrophic levels of 5% with uh, five degrees increase. I don't think, I, I, I don't think we'll get there. Uh, what's the second part of the question? Uh, the second part of the question was renewable energies. Um, there's carbon catching machines that are out there now. Um, and then also, how does military and nuclear weapons fit into the assessment? So we haven't tell you, so this is an ecological threat. Obviously, uh, yeah, when you're looking at conflict, military fits in with that. 
So when we're looking at, let's say, one of the areas we've spent a lot of time studying is the Sahel, not so much through the lenses of here, but through the lenses of terrorism uh, in particular. So some parts of the world now, are a, a lot of them are the ones with the worst ecological sustain, sustainability, basically uh, don't have functioning governments. Mm. So the governments are nominal, they have control of the, some territory, but they certainly do not have control of all their territory. This be true for parts of Nigeria, let's say, uh, yeah, 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 as well as sort of the number of the countries in, uh, yeah, yeah, in uh, yeah, the Sahel as well. Nuclear weapons, if we start letting nuclear weapons off, well, that's just going to accelerate the, uh, yeah, the heating of the earth dramatically. Yeah. Uh, the concept which has come up in the over the last five years of tactical nuclear weapons, just to be really clear, a tactical nuclear weapon still four or five times more powerful than most what was dropped on Nagasaki or Hiroshima, just to really be clear. They're not what we would think of a tactical yeah. nuclear weapon, which will uh, uh, take out a kilometre of land. Uh, the problem also with nuclear weapons of these size, you let off a few of them you know, over a particular area, then you've got a radioactive cloud. As the radioactive cloud falls, it then kills off all the crops as well. And that then land then becomes unusable for maybe decades a year after. So concept of being able to where you strategically control a nuclear weapon or a nuclear war is crazy. Okay. Well, thank you. Those were a bunch of questions that came in from the audience. So we tend to always leave those to the end and we don't get answers. So I wanted to do it up front. Um, right now, I want to move to Dr. Um, Dr. Ikilu. I hope I pronounced that correctly from the Neem Foundation. Um, we wanted you, uh, your uh, in Nigeria, working in Nigeria on these issues in the Lake Chad ba Basin. Um, how are these factors uh, that Steve was talking about, how are they influencing you? And more importantly, what do, what do you think are the, what could we be doing more? Uh, thank you so much. I, uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak uh, today. And um, I just want to say that I'm going to turn off my video uh, because there's a thunderstorm going on outside and uh, it's affecting the bandwidth so that I don't lose you, if that's all right. Um, so, so thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, I live and I work in Nigeria and the Lake Chad and I was going through the ecological threat report I was really amazed at how many of the findings are directly reflective of what we see on the ground, and not just in Nigeria, the Lake Chad, but also across the Sahel, and more so actually in the last 10 years, uh, the kinds of ecological threats that we, we see uh, um, now is um, mainly desert encroachment uh, across a I, I am so sorry, my apologies uh, for the weather today. Um, I hope you can still hear me. We can hear oh, you. Go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. And I hope that the internet will hold. Uh, so the kinds of things that we see is uh, desert encroachment, uh, rising temperatures that have actually changed the whole agriculture industry because the whole timetable of planting has had to uh, change considerably. Uh, we also see a lot of uh, erosion. Uh, this year we've had delayed rains and when the rains came uh, they came very severely so we have uh, flooding. Three quarters of the 37 states wow. in Nigeria are witnessing severe flooding uh, with over 70,000 hectares of farmland that have been destroyed this year alone. 
another 70,000 hectares are partially destroyed. So what that has meant for us is that millions have been left totally without shelter. And it's adding to the numbers that are homeless from historic floods that we've had in years uh, gone by. Uh, I, a lot of people have heard about the shrinking of the Lake Chad. Uh, this has been escalated to a national level, a policy level. Uh, um, Lake Chad was a source of livelihood for millions across more than four countries. Uh, it's shrunk by almost three quarters. And uh, this year, uh, parts of the Lake Chad Basin countries uh, are facing food shortages, uh, dealing with malnutrition, and in some cases, outright starvation. What the net result of all this is that we're seeing unprecedented social and demographic changes. Uh, the speaker before me talked about the rises in population. I think you mentioned Niger, who would be the most populous nation on earth. I don't know if I heard you right. I think. Probably Nigeria is set to become the most populous country on earth probably in the next 50 years. And um, we have seen massive shifts from rural centers to urban continents. And while we talk about uh, things um, that the, the devastating effects in, in terms of uh, inability for these urban centers to provide adequate shelter, sanitation, access to energy, food, education, or even very basic services. We don't also talk about the erosion of culture that happens when uh, these communities are changed in uh, unprecedented ways, and uh, we're forced to live in more urban connotations. So uh, the ecological threats we, we face in Nigeria, we're seeing more and more linkages to conflict, uh, both the Boko Haram insurgency and the ISWAP. Uh, Islamic State West Africa province um, conflicts. Uh, insurgents have taken over some of the remaining farms that haven't been uh, affected by floods and uh, they prevented citizens from farming in a bid to increase uh, national food insecurity. And these increased hardships have actually you know, a, a emboldened insurgent groups, but it's also created a group of much more willing recruits um, and there is, we see this more and more that in areas where there is growing ecological threat, people are being pushed to the limits and there's a scramble for resources and we see growing crime, both rural and urban crime, uh, and it's splitting communities against each other. And we've seen uh, community cohesion gradually replaced with violence and uh, criminality. Um, I could go on, but I'm not sure that okay, um, so my internet is sold. Well, um, Fatima, before you go, can you tell us quickly, so what are some of the answers? What, what is your organization and others doing that you're seeing some positive results? Can you hear us? Okay, I'd like to talk, yes, I can. I'd like to talk about um, not just the work that we do uh, um, at NIME, uh, but also the importance that when we respond to these threats that we have a uh, much more holistic response. And when I say holistic, that we don't really have both state and non-state actors that coalesce just around humanitarian needs, often in the immediate aftermath of a disaster or conflict, or longer term developmental needs. I think we pay very little attention to emotional well-being of the people that are directly affected. And this is what we do. Uh, I run an organization that's focused on rebuilding the mental and emotional distress uh, that people suffer from both ecological threats and conflict or the combination of both. And uh, these uh, range from depression, uh, PTSD, anxiety, as well as uh, other psychological distress. And um, we work in 12 states in Nigeria and across the Lake Chad Basin areas. And uh, we have come across thousands that uh, as a result of displacement, whether internally or people who become refugee, conflict refugees or conflict refugees that have untreated trauma, and this could last for generations. So even if the ecological threats are mitigated and the conflict lessened or eradicated, um, people will continue to suffer. Uh, currently uh, in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria in particular, but again, as we've seen with COVID where there's been an increased need for mental health, there is no adequate infrastructure for uh, responding to mental health uh, as problems uh, evolve and work. 
more. So one of the things that so we try to do is to try and develop uh, for our region what an infrastructure for mental health that deals in conflict and deals in uh, with people who are displaced by um, having a new way of thinking about um, providing treatment for people who suffer by training lay councillors in the communities where conflict uh, is prevalent. Uh, so we, we feel that uh, this uh, prioritizing mental health not only heals the individual, but it strengthens them and it enables them to cope with adversity, but it also heals fractured communities. And what we've seen is that this has proven to be a powerful tool for peace. So it, we've seen that it's building long-term resilience, at least in the communities that I work in. So just to conclude, I'd like to say, that to address rising ecological threats or conflict, uh, we need political will, uh, we need a more joint uh, response by all actors and an increased awareness of the dangers ahead. And we need programs that are bold and innovative. And for example, if you think about tree planting, uh, think not just for the needs of the community, but the state, the planet, but also what are the needs of that individual that's suffering it today? So thank you. So Dr. Um, Fatima, I can't agree with you more. Um, first of all, thank you for putting uh, some, um, um, it's making you know, this report come to life with exactly what you're seeing and how it's being played out in, um, in your country. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, Steve's whole point, resilience, resilience, resilience. Um, we know that countries that have a higher resilience did better during COVID, right? We we know this is so important. And that emotional piece, um, that trauma, uh, the peace building field does a horrible job at it. Um, and I just wanna do a shout out to Beyond Conflict. Um, there's some really good tools there. Um, and this is what they're, they're looking at the brain science. So just wanna give a shout out to them um, and their barefoot psychology um, uh, document, their tool. Okay. With that, moving over to again, once again, um, your work at USIP. So what do you, you know, with the data, we see it, what do we do about it? What, do you, what how are you guys working on this? Make us feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna get under the table right now. You posed me an interesting <laughs> challenge in terms of making us all feel good. But thank you so much, Liz. And Steve, I really wanted to say thank you to you and IEP for investing in this kind of report and continuing to publish mm -hmm. it for the last few years. Uh, Dr. Fatima mentioned the need for political kind of will to address things. And I think that these kinds of reports are so critical for helping us get our heads around a problem in a way that really is a powerful tool in increasing political will. And so I thank you and the rest of your staff for continuing to put out such kind of thought provoking reports. You know, in terms of what we're doing at the U.S. Institute of Peace, we recently started a program on climate, environment, and conflict. And um, USIP is a weird organization where we work heavily on policy issues, but also have on-the-ground programming. At the moment, our climate, environment, and conflict program is more focused on the policy side, and we're beginning to work on three major themes. One on migration and displacement related to climate and environmental change. One on the risks of conflict associated with a just transition to a global green economy, whether it's, it's at the very local level around mining conflicts as we seek out new green minerals or implement renewable energy and are thinking about the equity of that implementation all the way up to geopolitical conflict. And then the third area is on transboundary water management in a changing climate. Now, I would like to comment first on the migration and displacement area that we're working on, because one of the biggest takeaways from your report for me was, or one of the things that I was most thankful to see in it was really the focus on megacities and how we're not even getting our head around the cities issue right now. In a week or two, we are going to be hosting a session at the Geneva Peace Week, specifically on migration and displacement and its impact on cities, and what that means for kind of the increasing challenge on environmental issues in cities, but also what that means for urban fragility and how we begin to tackle environmental issues, climate change, and urban fragility all at one time. And, you know, 
you talked specifically about mega cities. When we look more widely at a definition of city, then we're talking about over 6,000 kind of government units at the urban level, whereas we have less than 200 countries when we're talking about at the national level. And so how do we begin to work with those political entities more effectively on all of the challenges that they face is one issue that we're beginning to wrestle with. I know you have other speakers, so I might stop there, but just thank you very much for this report. It's really thought-provoking, thought and this kind of work is so incredible for raising the political profile and getting us to focus on really important emerging issues. So thank you, and thank you for your partnership as well. Um, you are doing phenomenal work. Um, and it's, it was interesting, we had PeaceCon in uh, 2021, um, and you really pushed hard for our high level panel. So that's our, our conference that we do the first day with USIP. You really pushed for the high level panel to be focusing on climate change. I was a little skeptical at the time. You were right. I was wrong. Um, and uh, there we had our colleagues from USAID um, talking about what do we do? How do we change these policies? It's the political will. So, Allison. Over to you um, from USAID, uh, you guys have put out a great climate strategy. Uh, you worked with us, all of us in this community to make sure that we got, you know, the language of compounding <laughs> conflict and peace building. I know we were a little bit of a pain, but, um, uh, but now how do we make sure that it gets implemented and what are some of the challenges you see where can we succeed in this? So you're the political will. Thanks, Liz, and thanks um, for having me today. I'm so thrilled to be on this panel and talking with, um, you know, amongst such amazing experts. I'm really grateful for the report that just came out. I'm going to be trying to use it broadly, widely uh, throughout the agency. One of the things that I think um, we are really good at in the U.S. government is having good expertise. At USAID, we have been working on climate. You know, Tegan was there for, for years and years, really um, promoting, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, the need for looking at climate change. And so we have the expertise. We have the, the climate risk assessments, et cetera. Um, on the other side, we have really strong um, people on the conflict prevention and peace building side of things. We have a new Bureau for Conflict Prevention and Stabilization. We, um, and so individually we have the expertise, we have the structures to be able to um, look at this problem multi, you know, multidimensionally. What's been hard for us is getting those pieces together, getting them to come together. And um, one, of the, one of the phrases I've been using recently is that everyone wants their issue integrated but nobody wants their issue to be integrated into. And so, you know, as I talk to my climate colleagues, it's really hard to have them see why conflict, the conflict context is as important to the work as the climate work. As I'm talking to my conflict and peace building colleagues, it's really hard for them to understand why understanding that climate context is really important for them to um, be able to succeed in what they're trying to do. You know, one of the big successes I think we had, um, and as one of the, the lead drafters of that climate strategy, one of the things that I worked on really hard was to get all of the voices in the room, not only across the agency and every sector, but also from the missions, also from our external partners, really trying to understand what are the issues that we're facing and how can we set that into um, the, the strategy and into to policy that can be enacted. Um, to your question, how are we doing that? Not only do we have this new bureau, we have a new center for violence prevention, which um, has brought on a conflict integrator for the first time. We also have a climate security 
a very small but, but powerful climate security team that is working across uh, the interagency and with um, the partners such as as yourselves, as USIP, um, Adelphi, you know, CIPRI, we're, we're trying to work across borders and across agencies, across topics to make sure that we aren't being siloed, that we're not trying to talk about a topic one dimensionally and re we really understand the confluence on that compounding issue of climate change and um, and conflict. And let me be really clear, when I say climate change, I don't just mean a change in climate. I mean the environmental degradation. I mean the, the aspects that are beyond just what's going on but with nature. It's what is our human experience with the environment and how are we um, increasing the, the negativities that we that we experience. You know, I was really um, interested in what, what uh, Dr. Akilu was saying about the violent extremist organizations and how they have more fodder for bringing people in because of the environmental stressors. You know, these are not separate topics. They are so intertwined. And one of the things that we are really trying to do both at USAID and throughout the, you know, throughout the NSC process and, and within the US government across the across the board is getting these topics really intertwined um, and, and understanding where the one can't go on without the other and, and how they really interplay. So I'm, I'm really, again, grateful for this report, this opportunity to, to have this discussion um, and be able to take this report back and show my colleagues, see, you can't go it alone. You've got to, we've got to work together. See, I did it again. In this new strategy, I'm gonna push a little, where do you think, where are you already seeing some successes? Uh, with you yeah. know, working on the climate and conflict. Absolutely. So one of the successes um, on the very specific climate and conflict realm is we, there are two places that I'm going to see it specifically. One is that there is a, a requirement within that climate strategy that we, um, for lack of a better term, do no harm, that we look at what are the impacts of our climate work on the environment and social structure of a place that we go into, which, which, you know, it requires us to be intentional about looking at the negatives of where we're going into and, and assume, you know, not assuming that adaptation work is only positive, that there could be maladaptation, that mitigation work is only positive, but where it could end up causing some um, or exacerbating some stressors. And, and one of the requirements of the strategy is to look at those. Um, another place that I think we have some success is as the conflict bureau, we are being required to develop an, a climate action plan. Um, it's required across the agency, every bureau um, and every mission is expected to develop a, an action plan to help promote and support the goals and the targets of the strategy. And so that's making us look internally in the conflict bureau where are the places that we can support um, any of those targets? You know, it is unlikely that we in the Conflict Bureau are going to decrease the amount of carbon dioxide that's going into the atmosphere or um, con conserve land mass. But what we can do is support um, the 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 land rights aspect. We can support, um, you know, the resilience and the, and the adaptation opportunities for um, for the populations. You know, one of the re one of the things that we are also starting to say to more and more people as they're as they're willing to listen is the peace building. Peace building is kind of a a a fundamental need in order to be able to do that extra resilience or extra mitigation work. We, it's really hard to get climate finance into a place where the, A, the, the donors or the, or the investors aren't going to have a return on investment and B, that those places, those, those communities can't absorb that, that financing to do something that's positive. The, so that governance structure and the uh, opportunity for absorbing the work is so crucial for us to be able to 
reach our targets um, through the climate strategy. And that's something that um, through this, not only through this climate action plan, but through this climate security lens that we are also pushing, which is absolutely agency wide. It, it you know it includes climate migration. It includes the the just transition um, energy wise. It includes uh, green and and critical mineral mining. It includes so many aspects. It includes the the influence of um, you know negative actors. It we are really trying to broaden the conversation around climate security and how much does it interact with the rest of what the agency is uh, promoting. So thank you. Um, and we uh, thanks for championing these issues and the political will um, because they could have easily not gotten into that strategy. So thank you for that. And sorry if we were a bit of a pain sometimes. <laughs> on these issues. Um, I blame Nick. Um, so, okay. USAID is a critical donor. Uh, they're critical in policy. Nobody will deny that internationally, but they're not the only one. Um, and especially looking at the multilaterals, the UN, um, the EU, uh, Richard Ponzio, our expert multilateral from the Stimson Center. If you want to know anything about this, he's the guy to go to, um, and also a great partner of AFP. Richard, how is how, how can we look at this from a multilateral perspective, and you know where you see those challenges and those successes? Great, thank you, Liz, and uh, congratulations, Steve, Michael, your IEP colleagues, for this third edition of a, a really really helpful resource, the Ecological Threat Report. Um, Thought-provoking, as several of our panelists have noted, but also uh, more than sobering, even outright demoralizing, uh, especially when you zero in on those 27 hotspot countries representing nearly a billion people on this small planet, and the emphasis, I think, zeroing in on targeted interventions in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, but also the Middle East and uh, North Africa region. It's interesting to note, in a few weeks' time is the COP27, in arguably the most significant, certainly biggest country at the intersection of these two critical regions, uh, the MENA region in Africa. So Egypt hosting that important meeting. And um, you know, besides my own Stimson colleagues, definitely uh, eager to put to use as we've done with all of your uh, collection of reports over the years, starting with the Global Peace Index. Um, I'd like to just note before turning to the, the main question Liz posed to me, um, as a multilateral guy, uh, that the uh, Stimson and six, five other partner institutions have embarked on a, a new phase of our Climate Governance Commission project. It's the high level phase led by Mary Robinson, and we're assembling a team around her. We'll have a meeting in uh, the Global South in not just uh, any country, city in Brazil, but in Recife, which many of you know is in the northeast of Brazil, facing all kinds of ecological risk uh, challenges at the heart of this report. So uh, we'll be feeding what we learn from that visit to, to the work of the Climate Governance Commission, but also to flag, just as uh, I can't come to Alliance for Peace Building and not hear uh, GFA mention, I Stimson, I, I heard it once at the outset, you got it, you slipped it in, but we're going to get our obligatory from the Stimson side, SOTF, that's the Summit of the Future in uh, September of 2024. But one of the key instruments, as the name would indicate, is, is gonna be a declaration on future generations, heavy emphasis on ecological risk, on um, the environment security nexus or climate security, um, which is mentioned quite, quite a bit. I, what I was also impressed besides the composite measurement tool that you've now done in three iterations is the climate survey. And I'd love to know maybe during the discussion how you uh, undertook that and just that awful uh, finding that there's a decrease in concern about climate, <laughs> maybe because of the pandemic, but of course we would like to see those numbers actually going in the other direction. On um, the multilateral action, you know, whether it's our work with the Climate Governance Commission or Stimson more generally, a big environmental security program that I'm sure interacts with USIP and other partners in this town, um, we look at what is often called a whole of system approach Really glad that uh, Liz gave us this opportunity to say, yeah, everybody knows about the COPs 
and UN Environment Program and other environmental bodies, but it's the global economic agencies that have come on strong, including in this town, the World Bank and the Adaptation. They had a big commission themselves with Ban Ki-moon in recent years. Um, we, uh, in something that I think is at the heart of this report, look quite a bit at security institutions. A number of people, the Security Council has a friends or a whole group and, and meetings around um, uh, environment security issues. It's quite controversial because they can't forge consensus. But I'd like to highlight from my own experience with the peace building architecture, just a few key words. And if there's time, I'm going to watch time closely. Uh, don't worry, Nick. Um, if there's time, I'll talk about peacekeeping and some of the uh, renewable energy work that is at the heart of our research at the Stimson Center and, and, and greening peace ops. But on the peace building architecture, uh, what's important about this um, new initiative of the last 17, 18 years is its emphasis on adopting integrated and holistic approaches to addressing climate-related security risks. Uh, many of you know it has 31 member states but that's only part of it. It actively engages global and regional intergovernmental bodies, as well as non-state actors from civil society and the business community. Another uh, strength in addressing uh, the climate security uh, nexus is its active engagement or in the way it examines multiple drivers of violent conflict and consequent adoption of interdisciplinary approaches to building durable and just uh, uh, fragile affected countries and regions. And um, so I, I think it's well placed to do this, and in particular, the language that's near and dear to this community, the Alliance for Peace Building's work, is the PBC's commitment to building national ownership and capacities for better managing and over time addressing the root causes of violent conflict, which, as we've discussed today, include uh, very much um, environmental and more specifically climate-related factors, again, emphasized in this latest ecological threat report. The, uh, besides the policy dialogues and also on the ground engagements of various con country configurations, there's even some more regional engagements going on through the peace building architecture. And, and of course, lessons learned and other policy dialogues in, in New York. The peace building fund is offering a steady flow of financial resources, often tied to UN operational technical agency assistance on the ground that help fragile states to better address the root causes of conflicts related to climate change. Since 2017, the Peace Building Fund has invested uh, close to 70 million through 29 projects in 20 countries towards climate security. And several of these initiatives have underscored the importance of cross-border and regional programming seen in the Sahel, across the Pacific uh, region, which we've been discussing with Steve in recent days. Um, and in particular, activities have focused on um, ending violent conflicts with transboundary water management, issues, extreme weather events, and the role of women and youth in the management of natural resources tied to the very important women, peace and security, youth, peace and security agenda. Um, I see we're coming, uh, yeah, I'm coming up on seven minutes. So I'm gonna save the comments about uh, peace operations and our research there, which is quite innovative to green uh, peace operations because it's the most uh, uh, green unfriendly part of uh, the secretary. And it's part of a massive agenda. The sec secretary general is trying to practice what they preach in the UN terms as the UN tries to lead the way for, for countries on climate action. So happy to talk further if there's interest. Thank you, Liz. Um Thank you, Richard. Uh, and also, uh, you wrote an article on the Summit of the Future, which takes place in September. Is that correct? Is it so, so it was supposed to be in yeah. September 2023. Uh, there's an SDG Summit Goal 16 yeah. uh, and, and a ministerial form, form. So there will be a high level event in a year's time. But that's the precursor to the actual summit, which is in September 2024. So we have two years to work on okay. all kinds of monumental changes, including looking at the system as a whole. So what could be you know a better... Uh, case study, thematically speaking, than the environment security nexus. Um, okay, so we put your article in the chat. Um, and so this is a really key point. So thank you. Um, that summit of the future and the SDG 16. Um, and, you know, we can't do anything at the Alliance for Peace Building without talking about the Global Fragility Act. I tried not to. Um, but you know, this was so important, again, in the political will that this administration added climate change to the Global Fragility Act, the Global Fragility Strategy. Um, and so that's something that we're looking closely in these 10-year country plans that are just being developed as well in terms of how, you know, that's, an, again, an innovation piece where we can see that um, happen. Um, okay, so uh, any, okay. Um, one of the questions that just came in is why do you keep talking only about climate insecurity or even climate security 
Instead, let's call it the climate peace and security agenda like the WPS and the YPS. Okay, that's uh, uh, climate peace and security. Why don't, why, and this goes to your point, uh, Steve, it's a little bit more positive, the positive piece. How, how do we talk better about this, I think, is what, what this person is saying. What are we doing wrong? Yeah, Nork, I think it's great. So I think the what we need to do quite often is try and frame these things with more positive language. So one, I'll get, tell you a story. In the very, very early days when I came to do the Global Peace Index, I would, particularly here in Washington, more so than anywhere else here, I was told, don't call it the Global Peace Index. No one. No one is going to take you seriously. Why don't you talk about human security index? And sort of, for me, I, what I wanted to talk about was peace, because peace is positive. So as soon as you come back and put the word security in there, it's a shriveled concept of a human being. It's not a concept of human being which flourishes. So I think the concept of taking and framing anything in a positive light is a lot more likely to stimulate the more positive aspects in people. So human security, for example, the first thing I think of is where are the troops? Okay, where are the troops? Whereas I'm talking about a peace index, I'm starting to think about the people who are on this call, aren't I? It's totally differently frames it. So I'm all for it. But one thing I would say when we're talking to talk about climate change and ecological threats, and why didn't we if you read the report and you look at this presentation, there's a little bit on climate, but not much. And that's very, very deliberate because these ecological threats are there today, they're manifesting and they need to be addressed. So in editing the report, there was a lot in there on climate, and I took it out because the researchers, when they go to climate, now start to go to greenhouse gas emissions, and you miss the whole point, the exercise in this report. It's that these problems are there today. They need to be addressed. With all, Climate change will aggravate them, uh, uh, amplify them, but they're there today and they need to be dress, addressed independently of climate change. And if you're not, if they're not, they're just going to get an awful lot worse. Well, and I think you also raise a really good point because in many countries, um, climate change is politicized. And so, you know, you talk a lot about sameness. You know, everybody wants uh, safe drinking water. You know, people want clean air. People want, you know, they don't want their house destroyed. But so I think that that's, um, I know, you know, that's one of the ways that this report, I think, um, uh, you know, goes beyond that. And I think that's really important. Um, okay, political will. How, wh that's what you guys are working on. How can, what can we do as a community to do more to push political will um, and, how, how do you how do you think we should do it and what more should governments donors be doing sorry to put you on the spot no worries it's just <laughs> uh you know i had worked for the us government for many years and you know sometimes you were very careful talking about that and now we actually have an opportunity to talk you're more free. about it you're freer now i know exactly it's wonderful <laughs> um that's just kind of a joke though you know I think one of the things that I have really been aware of looking at what's happening internationally on climate change right now is we still have a fairly mechanized approach to climate change. We're still thinking about technologies. We're thinking about access to technologies in new places, in part to address those mitigation issues that we're talking about. But even when we're talking about adaptation, we're often talking about technologies to support adaptation. We're talking about other instruments, whether it's insurance, whether it's financial mechanisms. We're talking a lot about the mechanics of how to address climate change, whether we're talking about the mechanics of addressing greenhouse gas emissions or the mechanics of addressing um, adaptation or even the mechanics of addressing environmental degradation. And it seems to me that especially on the climate change side, we do need to shift the conversation. 
I think there's a wide recognition that we're made up of social and economic and political systems, but sometimes it's easier to fix the engineering problems than it is to deal with the ramifications of the interconnections with all of these systems. And part of what we need now is to be thinking about how we change social systems, how we get to political will in particular cases, how we get to will to change social systems to support stronger environments, to address climate change more productively and so on. Part of that links very closely to the conflict agenda as well, because when we're just thinking, ah, oh, let's go towards a global green economy, then we think about you know, the spread of solar energy, we think about wind energy, we don't necessarily think about labor unrest. We don't necessarily think about community uprisings and this unrest related to implementation of these technologies where there are land rights concerned and where communities are losing land to see energy produced that is bypassing them to go to a capital city and they still don't have access to grid energy. And so how do we actually build into our thinking building resilient social systems and pathways that allow us to deliberately address these risks in a very proactive manner to support the change that we need. And it comes down to human beings. And that's peace at a very local level. It's peace at a community level. It's peace at a country level. It's regional conversations too, and not just global conversations about how we increase uptake of technologies and how we get the private sector investing more in technologies. It's also addressing all of these linked components of political and social and economic systems that come down to human beings and being a bit more proactive about taking those social systems into account and thinking about how we build transformational change in how we work through social systems and take into account and deliberately focus on where are the sticky points? Why is there conflict about particular things? How do we work our way through it so that the other changes are possible needs to be a greater focus of what we do. And so I've really appreciated the focus on transformational change that's coming out of the climate adaptation movement. Mm -hmm. I really focus, appreciate an increased focus these days on how conflict and environmental issues and conflict and climate change are overlapping and the, and the increased awareness on this um, and really advocate for getting ahead of this to put social systems front and center before we push for technological changes without thinking about how human systems actually adapt to and address massive, massive change. So you get at the resilience and that's exactly yeah. what this report was talking about. You know, countries that have high scores and resilience can do better. They can, they can, they work together to figure it out. I mean, that's really what this report highlights and it's exactly what you were saying. Richard, did you, you wanted to say something? Yeah, and I'll keep this to a minute, but it's really great that in the policy recommendations at the end of uh, Steve's presentation, micro level interventions, resilience, it starts at the local, if not national level, that's where the 2030 agenda for sustainable development is focused. But as Steve also said, you know, if we're going to keep it below two degrees Celsius, not even 1.5, the rollout of technological fixes, the need for global coordination, that's where these global institutions come in. And if we're satisfied with the business as usual cops coming up in a few weeks time, we're saying, listen, we can continue to tweak and there have been improvements since the Paris Agreement a couple of years ago and we're ratcheting up ambition and more verification and we should continue to do that. But we should say a whole of system approach and, and not to overemphasize the importance of this other summit, but it speaks to the four dimensions of the ecological uh, threat uh, reports composite measurement tool. Food security, which you probably noticed is the number one issue these days. Secretary Blinken hosted a meeting on this very issue in the Security Council in May. It was a top part of uh, President Biden's speech last month. Water, stress, population growth, natural disaster. We need 
to look at the system as a whole. And so this summit, the next two years, is set up for that. And building the political uh, momentum and support means um, track 1.5 di dialogues, engaging the policymakers, both the ambassadors and their capitals, but larger social movements, civil society getting energized around these issues. And quite frankly, global governance reform innovation is not a sexy topic like human rights or going deep in any one of these areas, climate. It's a nice hook, but to get people interested in systemic change takes a lot of work. And it's so important that communities like Alliance for uh, Peace Building are, are part of that conversation to, to use these next two years. Okay, thank you. Allison and uh, Dr. Fatima, do you have any closing thoughts? Yeah, sure. I just, I think that when we talk about the, the localization, the human aspect of this, whether it is the social um, and the and the emotional support that Dr. Akula um, was talking about, or whether we're talking about making sure that our um, responses, our are locally driven and aren't bypassing those who are in the communities, um, who are not in the, the cities. I think that focusing on people as we are doing our work is, is really the most important thing to, to, uh, to do as a, as a global. It's easy to, rem to think of organizations as entities or countries as entities or governments, but really these are people and really making those relationships and listening to people and what they need is uh, such an important aspect. Dr. Fatima, are you still with us? For well, highlighting um, the focus on people, I'd just like to say that um, it's a bit worrying that we are losing the momentum in terms of uh, uh, ecological because I, I see it even in Nigeria, despite the year that we've had with flooding, with drought, uh, there's a lot of climate uh, skeptics, deniers, and uh, this is, and I just urge us uh, to really not lose faith and to know that uh, this is work that will take uh, decades and generations, and it won't be done overnight. Yeah, we don't have a choice. Um, so. I wanna wrap up uh, and say uh, thank you to everyone. This great report, pass it out, uh, cite it, uh, you know, make its uh, data come alive, alive to make your points. Um, when we're talking about these issues, that's so important. Um, and think about, so what? So what do we do about it? What's working, what's not working? And I just wanted to say the resilience and the society is, is important, but also the technological. And we can do, you know, we can do both at the same time. And I think that's the, uh, that's the important piece. Although it seems like there's a lot more focus on the technology. So the resilience piece, we haven't, we haven't figured that one out yet. We haven't unpacked that. Um, we haven't been able to quantify that work. And I think that that's a really um, important piece, missing piece to all of this. So thank you and all this recording and also, sorry, my voice, this recording and the report, the slides will all be on um, AFP's website. So please, um, please use this data. Data is only as good as it's used. Um, so I can't say that enough. So thank you.